Hello, from a film about the fire at Notre Dame to a timely tale that's all too real about a pregnant woman refusing to leave her home on the Ukraine-Russian border. Thanks for joining us for our weekly film show. And we're joined by Ukrainian writer-director Marina Gorbak, who recently won an award at the Sundance Film Festival for her film Klondike, the story of a, Ura a Ukrainian family amid the Donbass conflict in 2014. Also with us is our film critic, Lisa Nesselson. Hello there. Thanks for joining us. Now, Marina, thank you for joining us. You're in Istanbul. Tell us a bit about how the past few weeks have been for you. Mm, we, were, we were in Berlin Ali Film Festival. It was our European premiere when everyone was talking about um, probably or eventually events in border of Russia and Ukraine. And we were just trying to tell to the international auditory that it happens. It started actually not now, but in 2014. And we were trying to bring this idea that it's not only the war uh, in Ukraine, but it's really the tragedy for the whole Europe. And we just after the Berlinale, where a film was awarded as well, uh, we just faced is all these terrible things which we are observing. It's now war in all media in Ukraine, and um, unfortunately, Klondike is very timely now, even it's telling about 2014. Well, your film um, shows the war's toll on ordinary people. Let's take a glimpse of it. The main character, Erka, is heavily pregnant. She refuses to leave her house, even as the village gets captured by armed forces. Tell us, why did you want to tell this story? You know, the story also telling about MH17 tragedy. It's international air crash catastrophe, which happened in Ukraine. But uh, the people who died, they were civilians from many, many countries, and there were no Ukrainians, no Russians. And uh, I was observing year after year that uh, the guilty people was not named, were not named. The, each year, 17th of July, it was coming, it also was my birthday, and we were coming to that date, and there were no answers. And then I just realized that if that huge international catastrophe has no voice, then what about Ukraine, absolutely speechless country in that moment, just two weeks ago, three weeks ago, 21 days ago, uh, the whole events which war happens in border of Russia and Ukraine, they were not even named war. It was always local conflict, conflict between locals or something like that. And that was the main motivation for me to do this movie, to bring artistical voice to the very, very timely tragedy, which we were really all in Ukraine feeling that it's coming closer and closer and in bigger scale, you know. The uh, woman protagonist in your film is very pregnant and the film is dedicated to women. Tragically, in real life, the pregnant woman uh, injured in the bombing of the maternity ward in Maripul last week died and her unborn baby could not be saved. The images were shocking and went all over the world. Stalin said that the death of one man is a tragedy and the death of a million people is a statistic. As an artist, how do you stop the audience becoming numb to violence and find ways to show the world that uh, violence has consequences? First of all, I would never tell something or be back voice of Stalin, never. He's a human crime, same as Putin. And, um, you know, I don't really believe that we can change by our movies some, some, someone's character or someone's opinion. We just can do something. And this is the main thing in this situation, that 
all of us who are fighting now just for right to live and for rights all and other people just to live. We are not fighting for the changing of politician status of the country. We are just want Ukrainians to live their lives, their normal civil daily lives. And all of us, including artists, we have to do something. And when I was making this movie, it was not with a big, huge aim to change somebody's opinion. It was just because I could not walk through. I just could not not to do or not to think or not to do something what I can do. And I can shoot films. That's why. That's it. Marina, um, the Ukrainian director Sergei Lotsnitsa recently said here in Paris that he's opposed to a blanket boycott against Russian artists because many of them are against this war. He said, I'm calling for everyone to remain reasonable and not be reduced to judging each person by their passport alone, but by their actions, since one's nationality is an accident of birth. Now, you're part of a group of seven Ukrainian directors who recently called for a complete boycott of Russian artists. Why do you think that's the right thing to do? I think because if there will be film festival or film organizations who will decide to bring Russian films, they will need to select who of the Russian film directors they can invite, who they will not invite. And then I want to ask these uh, directors of the, this film festival, will they be senders? Will they do a sendership? How they will select the directors? Will they check their social media? Will they check their Facebook? Will they check their Instagrams? What they will do, how they will select? You know, this is not time to make this blacklist. This is the time to have a position. And what we are telling about that we are really, we are pro-European country. We are against all post-Soviet uh, rules. And we are also against this selection because or we have position and we fight all of us, all European country. We show our force, we show our power, or we are just sitting and selecting people who has right to be presented in festivals and who is not. And then this is a censor, classical. OK, Marina Ergelbeck, thank you so much for joining us. We're thinking about you um, here in Paris. Your film is called Klondike. We're next to a film that's out in France this week called Notre Dame on Fire. It reconstructs the burning of Paris's famous cathedral hour by hour. It's made by the French director Jean-Jacques Hannault. We know how the story ends. The cathedral is still standing. Repairs are advancing and nobody was killed. Is the film still interesting, Lisa? Well, the film is mostly thrilling, even though there's the occasional groan-worthy line of dialogue or some borderline dopey secondary characters. The real events of that day played out as if God decided to go into screenwriting. You have an 850-year-old ready-made movie star, the cathedral, and a really persistent villain in the form of spreading flames. And heroes who happen to save lives for a living, but here are being asked to rescue ancient stones. Oh, and the cathedral contains priceless artifacts, religious relics, re religious relics, uh, a crown of thorns believed to be the original, and a nail from the true cross. Sensibly, they're securely locked up, but who has the key? Uh, incredibly, it was the first day of work for the man whose job it was to monitor a panel designed to warn a fire in the edifice. It's not only a landmark uh, and a tourist attraction, it's a house of worship, and it's a very big house. Security personnel checked out an alarm and gave the all clear after worshippers had been evacuated. Unfortunately, when people were invited back in to continue the Mass, uh, the fire was really taking hold invisibly above their heads because the wrong spot had been checked. It's a rule in screenwriting. To keep your viewer engaged, uh, you force your protagonist to confront and overcome obstacles. In real life, that fateful day was almost nothing but obstacles, and the film's sometimes minute-by-minute -minute structure really makes use of that. Well, it was directed by Jean-Jacques Hannault, and we can hear from him now. As is the case for everybody else, I saw these images from a distance, like we can see here, filmed by thousands of people. But I'd never imagined all the pitfalls, the series of malfunctions that almost led to an absolute disaster. Now, images of the Cathedral of Flame quickly went all over the world. What makes this movie consistently watchable, uh, despite some clunky moments and some really over-the-top musical score, uh, it's the brilliant way they've incorporated 
genuine footage, uh, drones from the government, uh, from overhead, from TV cameras, from cell phones, into the recreated proceedings. So we've all seen the flames and the smoke billowing from the ancient timber roof and the moment when the spire fell. But what nobody has seen until now, except the firefighters and some clergy, is what went on inside the building. Through incredibly impressive production design, they've put us in the narrow stone staircases, unstable rafters, in the bell towers. The film is consistently visual, and the emotional pegs are built right in. Uh, I've lived about four blocks from the cathedral for over 40 years, and I can vouch for the accuracy of the spatial geography. The men in charge of the Paris Fire Brigade really were stuck in traffic, the rush hour on larger streets, and always tricky on narrow streets. And you'll come out with an instant fresh appreciation of why you should never leave your bicycle or your van parked where they say you need to leave it clear for fire trucks. Okay, Lisa, thank you so much for your company and thank you for everyone at home for watching. Remember our website, we're also on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this. Je vous rappelle le code d'honneur des sapeurs-pompiers de Paris. Quand tu m'appelles, j'accours. Mais assure-toi de m'avoir alerté par les voies les plus rapides et les plus sûres. Les minutes d'attente te paraîtront longues, mais dans ta détresse. Pardonne mon apparente lenteur.